All right, everybody, we're going to get started. So if you'd like to take a seat. Got it. Now, hopefully, we won't get any. Hopefully, it won't do feedback or reverb or whatever it's called. Are we supposed to? Are we just going to stand together? Okay, so we'll stand together, or do you want us to stand? I don't know. It's, it's that okay. I remember to Check, check. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for coming out on this lovely, uh, cold, rainy January day. Uh, my name is Zach Parrish. I'm the programming librarian here at the Bexley Public Library. All right. Um, I just want to highlight a few upcoming programs we have. We have the Toni Morrison Day celebration on Sunday, February 18th from 1.30 to, to 4.45. And we have local poets, Vernell Bristow, uh, Stevie Knighton, Donna Marbury, and Scott Woods um, reading their favorite passages of Toni Morrison here. Um, so that'll be a wonderful program. Um, we also have uh, part two of the next chapter, Planning for the Future of Central Ohio, with Michael Wilkos from uh, United Way of Central Ohio. That will be Thursday, February 22nd at 6.30. Um, if you, we had part one last week. If you missed it, it will, it's on the Bexley Library's YouTube channel, so you can uh, watch it there. Um, and then we also have Throwback Thursday, uh, which will be uh, going over the, his, the history of the Drexel Theater, and that will be Thursday, February 29th at 7 o'clock, and that will be at the Drexel. So um, if you want to learn about uh, the history of the Drexel, please join us over there. Um, a quick note on how tonight's program will work. Uh, this is a hybrid program, so we have the in-person audience here in the library, and we also have an audience um, joining us online. Uh, so at the end, uh, when we get to the Q&A, part of the discussion. If you wouldn't mind just raising your hand, I'll bring the mic over. That way, those joining online can hear what was asked. Um, and for those um, at home, if you want to just type your question into the chat at any time, we'll get those asked at the end. Um, and we are very lucky to be joined uh, by tonight's presenters. Uh, Karen Boker has been the design consultant for the city of Bexley since 2001. Prior to doing design review for 
uh, several historic neighborhoods and municipalities. She was the master plan coordinator for The Ohio State University. She has a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Architecture from The Ohio State University and is NCARB affiliated. Um, Bill Heyer is an architect based in Bexley and has been involved with several commissions for the city of Bexley for over 15 years, including the Land Use Strategy Commission, uh, the Main Street Guidelines 2 Commission, the Zoning Rewrite Commission, and the Historic Preservation Working Group. His expertise in traditional and contemporary architecture has brought a diligent balance to the development of Bexley, and he continues to provide skills and guidance for the architectural architecture review board and was instrumental uh, to, of the development of the design guidelines being discussed tonight. Um, his Bachelor of Architecture degree is from Pratt Institute of New York and uh, his Master of Architecture degree is from University, University of Notre Dame. So I will turn it over to Karen Boker and Bill Heyer and thank you all for coming out. Thanks and thanks for that um, great welcome. Um, I uh, would be remiss first before we started to um, give you just a little bit of background on the design guidelines. It's a, it's a pro before we jump in. It's a project that we started probably 10 years ago, probably halfway through my tenure here in the city of Bexley. Um, lots of things got in the way, but when COVID happened, we found a hole in the schedule to kind of jump in and finally complete the design guidelines. Um, we've had quite a team on this all along. Uh, I did want to take just a minute because I'll forget if I don't do it on the front end to thank all the people that have been so helpful, um, especially Bill Heyer, who's my partner in crime here. He's the professional engaged um, to do a lot of the illustrations and the text. Um, he also serves on my architecture review board. He's a very valuable member and it's just been a pleasure to work together. Um, Larry Hellman has given a tremendous amount of time for those of you that were fortunate enough to be here for his lecture on the history of the Bexley neighborhoods. This is kind of the continuation that serves as a basis for all the work that we did. We'll touch a little bit on it, but that, that um, program is worth listening to. I think you have it archived online. Um, it, it's wonderful. It really tells, breaks down Bexley and all of its um, character neighborhoods and the architecture elements and characteristics of that of which we um, based a lot of this work on. I also wanted to thank all the Architectural Review Board members. Suzanne Tony is here, she's my chair at the time that it was, um, uh, the guts of this was worked on and passed by City Council. Um, I also would be remiss if I didn't point out, and I'm so thrilled to see Peter Bardwell, who um, worked a lot of years on this before he stepped down from his long tenure with the Architecture Review Board I think we worked together for 20 years. It was a, 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 he was, has been a great mentor and it was a great pleasure. Um, other than that, city council was awesome, very supportive, and this was passed last January, so it's been a year. That's when it went on, online. It became a live living document. Um, just to give you an idea of where we started, in 2000, the first design guidelines and standards were written, and there it is. It was four pages. It was very narrow in scope, like this is the roof, this is what you could do. No, no illustrations, no contextual information about neighborhoods, nothing. I mean, I'm literally able to fit it all on this slide. So we knew we were long overdue for design guidelines that could be, um, that, that our residents could touch and feel and be interactive with and drive around and understand where the concepts and the details that we're looking for and what our board is talking about when you go to an, a review meeting, for example, um, we needed a better guidance for our residents. So in 2023, um, January 24th, I remember it, the City Council passed the new de design guidelines and standards. It is a modernized um, design standards booklet. It's all on the computer. You can find it online. I am going to work hard to put it in several other places online because I know from hearing from a lot of you that you kind of have to dig. You look under Architecture Review Board and it is a document, a PDF on there so you can flip through. Um, we also, it is not quite a living document yet. That's our next step with it. We want to, uh, the next move is to make it cl click and take you there. So in other words, if it says, here's some roof manufacturers that we would recommend looking at or here is 
I mean, you can imagine any number of things. Here's the demolition ordinance. Click on it, and it will take you there. So that's kind of where we are now. Um, we're working on that next level of technology. Right now, it's just simply a PDF document, but you can, that's our next intention is to link it, to make it really go live. Um, part of this, and we're gonna talk about it a little bit, but like I had already mentioned, Larry Hellman gave a fabulous lecture on it, and it's available, is really a deep dive into the existing neighborhood characteristics. Because we're not, we're not starting from new, we're not a new community, we have been here a very long time, What's beautiful about Bexley is the architecture that we already have here. So we really wanted to do a deep dive and identify the characteristics that make um, Bexley's buildings beautiful, which Mr. Heyer will talk a lot about. Um, it is illustrated. Uh, the, well, Bill Heyer's firm had some interns that were available during COVID, and, and under his guidance, we are loaded with beautiful illustrations now throughout this document. Um, and it, it's just fabulous because I've, I know from doing this for, now for 23 years here that it is so true, the colloquialism, that a picture is worth a thousand words. Once I sketch something for a resident, it clicks. And now we have a whole document full of illustrations. Um, there are practical parts of this document as well. There are a lot of um, sections that will show you the responsibilities of all the different boards and how they're connected when it comes to building. Um, and the process that a resident needs to go through to get something approved. And that we've had a lot of feedback on already. It's very helpful because in the past, when we only had the four-page document, a resident is dependent on picking up a phone and hoping the right person answers to find out what the next step is. But now we have flowcharts. Um, if you have a variance, if you don't have a variance, I'm gonna show you an example of that. And we also have a lot of design and planning examples so if somebody says, you know, well, I don't know how, we pride ourselves, let me back up and say when we first approved, when we first, um, when city council for, first approved architecture review as a process at the city of Bexley, we were determined that it wouldn't be too cumbersome for residents who wanted to do small projects and didn't have the, the ability to go hire an expensive architect or designer or really didn't need to if you just want a front porch. So we do have, we have also included in this document examples, good and bad examples, of how to do eaves and porticos and small things and big things. So um, talking about the components of this entire document, there is, as I mentioned, the history and evolution of the neighborhoods, um, understanding the standards and examples. So the history of the evolution of Bexley neighborhoods, well, Bexley, as we know, is an architectural treasure. I'm going to hand it over to Bill. Uh, Are you good with that? Yeah. Um, this is the map that was created by Mr. Hellman. And um, you may jump in at any time if you'd like to. But I'm going to hand it over to Bill to kind of walk through uh, how the neighborhoods were broken down. Um, we won't spend a tremendous amount of time on this because that has been done. But it's super important because that the understanding the different characteristics of the neighborhood where porches are, where, where big estates are, where certain uh, front yards are set back further. Understanding the areas that you're in in the neighborhoods is really important to getting to um, the design characteristics and guidelines and standards that we're looking for within those neighborhoods. Yeah. I, I'm, I've, I've been a resident of Bexley since 2002. And I remember when I was doing research on the different neighborhoods in Bexley, I had never heard of some of these names, like Parkview Round, which those of you who have spent your lives here, you probably know a lot of these neighborhood terms, but you can see a lot of them have multiple names for their, for their, for their area. Bexley Park, Rudolph Fair, Rudolph's Fairwood, and Bexley Highlands. And Larry could tell, talk all day about each of these areas and where, where those names came from. For me, it was... Uh, putting together the characteristics of each of these particular neighborhoods and why were there different names for these different areas. And so the map that we created with Larry's help is color-coded to show you where these different neighborhoods are. And our goal was to discover what the uh, character of that particular neighborhood was and how it might be different or similar to other parts of Bexley. 
Um, and so we discovered a lot. We went around as a team and we photographed with permission, uh, you know, down the streets, and um, we started analyzing the architecture of these different neighborhoods, including the general height and massing, uh, the window proportion to wall, the kinds of chimneys, the kinds of entryways, um, the materials that were being used, the proportions. And those really struck me as having uh, a unifying element for Bexley. Okay, you go all around Bexley, and you might have a, you might have differences in character between these different neighborhoods, but the thing that really ties Bexley together is the materials, it's the proportion, it's the scale, okay, all the human quality of the buildings and the landscape, including the trees and, uh, and street trees and private trees, and so all of this was. We were documenting. Um, our team actually went through the neighborhoods and thought about the trees and how big they would be when they matured. We, we didn't want to draw the trees as they appeared on Google. We want, and some neighborhoods obviously had trees that were newly planted. So we wanted to include trees, especially street trees, that we knew were um, what, what they would look like when they were mature. And what's fascinating for me for us, was, there were a lot of things, but one of them was that the trees and the relationship to the streets also gives unique character to some of the neighborhoods, but still unifies. So for instance, uh, in Ashbourne, in that area, the trees act very differently with the street and with the houses than you'll find in South Bexley, okay? And so we wanted to document all of that, and that's really the first step after understanding the history of Bexley and the architect, where the architecture came from, um, now it was time for us to grow to understand and appreciate what we have here. And there's so much to appreciate looking through these design guidelines. The relationship of the massing of the houses to the street, how close is the street, the grade differences. There are actually streets in Bexley that have some pretty impressive grade differences. Uh, including Pleasant Ridge, which as you go down it, there are houses that have dramatic grading up to, their, up to the house. Other neighborhoods um, have curved streets instead of straight streets. And so there's all kinds of relationships, and you can see that the character, for instance, in a lot of the neighborhoods in central Bexley, you'll have a wide variety of detail on the house and the massing, the shapes, and yet, there are so many things that tie it together, like the floor plates and the distance from first to second floor. Um, even though, like in this example, you can see you have a colonial house next to some kind of uh, Cape Cod, Dutch-style house, different material, but the entryways, the detail that's put there, chimneys that tie them together, one's on the side, one's on the front. These are the things that unify the neighborhoods, okay? and so. All of these diagrams that we put together are part of that design guidelines package. Neighborhood, what's the quality of that particular neighborhood? How do we define that? Um, and those are the kind of things that build your appreciation, but will also help you to understand, and I, I hope for contractors and architects in particular, and designers, that they will appreciate those neighborhoods more because of these guidelines. I'm going to take over here a little bit longer and then hand it back to Bill when we get into the material, to, into the guts of the design guidelines and standards. But a really important part of this whole document and this whole effort for me as the consultants um, and having quite a history with Bexley is to try to make this document usable and an impetus for better engagement between City Hall, the staff, the consultants, the board members, and applicants, developers, homeowners. Um, anybody that wants to build in Bexley. So the very first thing that, um, I, that I was concerned about is making sure that we describe the building process and put the tools out there for those who are going to be building in Bexley um, to find a place where they can live. These are an example of two of, I think, four or five flow charts that are in the design guidelines. So now when um, residents come and apply, they you have a variance? Do you not have a variance? Um, is it just 
a short application, for example, windows don't need to go to the board unless you're going to replace um, a, an old historic window that, that is worth the board looking at. Um, these all tell you, and it's a, it's a very um, easy to read flow chart with colors so that residents know where to go. Uh, if you need to go to a Tree and Public Gardens Commission, which by the way, I should also point out and thank Susan Quintens for coming. That's another big part of our process as well. There, um, there's a lot of verbiage. Yes, I, it's hard, it's tedious to write, it's tedious to read, but it's very helpful and I tried to be brief. But it is amazing how many people that don't work in building, aren't designers, just live in a house, don't, didn't understand what the different committees were, commissions, boards, so that's all spelled out in the document as well. Definitions, we really got into, we really had a long discussion about this and we decided that it's worth a few page, the extra pages, it's all electric now, you don't have to carry around a big book. Um, it's important, people don't know what mass means, scale, structure, symmetry. There are probably six or seven pages of definitions and it's been incredibly helpful to residents who've never, had a, uh, who've never done a building project before. Uh, along with these definitions, they're not as, they're not as uh, painterly as some of Bill's um, diagrams, but I also put some illustrations in to, so people can see. When I say, you know, that's not the right kind of dormer, you really need a wall dormer instead of a hip dormer. This is, it's spelled out in the document. Um, and I use it a lot. I, I know that people aren't gonna search through 169 pages of a document to find this. So it's a tool for me as much as it is for anybody else. I will print off one page instead of giving you a whole book. Oh, wait, I have that. Let me print it off for you so you can see what a wall dormer is. We also have some logistical things so people can understand graphically um, lot sizes compared to garage sizes compared to height differences. So th this is more kind of a, a graphic um, a zone, zoning code kind of interpretation graphically so people can understand why we say um, in a lot of our neighborhoods in South Bexley, some in Central Bexley and North, well actually everywhere, we don't want you to have a garage that has the same ridge line as your house. And this kind of puts that into perspective so you can really see why the scale of the primary structure um, is important and a garage is secondary. This gives you a good kind of graphic representation of the zoning code. Um, a new part of this, and it did get in there, um, it was passed by city council, is about solar panels. That is no longer something that needs to come to the board. I have full authority to approve the solar panel designs. Some of these issues, and I think it will only increase as um, solar roof, roof uh, like Tesla tiles come into play and more, as the greening of our environment becomes more and more important. There becomes, and we won't get into a long discussion, but you can imagine a, a design versus morality issue that we try to keep away from at the board meeting. So what we did come to the conclusion, and well, city council did, is that solar panels are all fair game here, but they do have to um, adhere to some pretty specific design guidelines that come through staff. For example, they need to be symmetrical, with each, they need to be uni, unidirectional things like that, so you can find that in this as well. Um, I've also cut and pasted a lot of the information from the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation so people can understand we have a lot of beautiful old early 19th century homes and there really, there really are some standards that we don't require but they're very helpful to understanding how nationally um, additions to old structures have been studied, things like um, keeping the old and putting a hyphen. I, I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about, like putting a kind of a secondary structure to show it, literally a hyphen, a building piece to connect a more modern piece. So there, there are precedents. We, we don't necessarily stick to them all the time in our ARB. We don't have a problem in our architecture review board with somebody putting an addition on a traditional home that follows all the traditional design standards elements that are already there but we thought it would be very helpful to put kind of nationally an excerpt from what has been implemented in some communities. Okay, I'm handing it back to you. Yeah, and I'm still waiting for that first project where somebody proposes a traditional addition to a modern, a modernist house. Yeah, that's not gonna house. happen. 
I really want that in front of the ARB. Um, so really, the, the goal of this uh, graphic part of the design guidelines was to showcase uh, all these relationships and, and the beauty of the buildings of Bexley. This, and the residential aspect of the design guidelines is really phase one. Phase two, uh, which I have been in contact with uh, the mayor and with um, the building office, is that we would also do this for commercial and for civic buildings so that we have guide, design guidelines for that level, that, that, that typology of, of building, which we have a lot of in Bexley. So, um, but this is a great start because now we can kind of explain and showcase the beauty uh, of the buildings of Bexley and how you can appreciate it and build off of it for your additions, for uh, building in context and neighborhoods if you're doing a demolition and a new build. Um, and especially helpful for the designers and the contractors uh, who will need to adhere to, to these, and they can use them as, as, as uh, guides along the way. Um, it's important to talk about the difference between a standard and a guideline. So standards are widely accepted principles and considerations. They're foundations of good design. It's more broad. And then the guidelines are the details. And we're going to show you examples of what those good details are and what we, in illustration form, are details that you would want to avoid because they're not part of the character of Bexley. Okay, there's lots of neighborhoods around Columbus and around the country, and you've all been to them, where the details are starting to kind of all look bland and blocky and the same. And that is not the character of Bexley. It never was. And so we want to make sure that that character continues. Um, and to be honest, a lot of uh, designers and contractors uh, have not experienced what it means to work with a lot of these traditional uh, details. And I'm not, when I say traditional, I don't just mean you know, colonial or Tudor. The modern architecture of the 1950s and 40s also had a lot of character to their details proportion and so on, and we showcase some of that in the guidelines. The goal is to make sure that that consistency continues for the city of Bexley. Why? Because as Sheila Straub always said to me and Mike Carruthers would say, you know, the beauty of Bexley continues to improve our property values, okay, and continues to grow the city uh, uh, with people who want to move here. If, if we wind up having Bexley and its quality deteriorate in terms of the architecture, then it's not going to be the same. It won't be the same. It, it, we're not going to see that continued um, improvement and beautification of the city. So what are the things that make it beautiful? It's the proportion. It's the relationship of parts, or, and we'll explain a little bit of that. And then materiality, the materials that are being used throughout Bexley. Um, other things that are important that we've learned our lesson on with, a, with some cases that have come before the board is that we need to uh, help residents and help designers and contractors understand context. When you're building in a neighborhood, it doesn't matter what style you're building in, you are building in a neighborhood that has a particular character with particular context. And that includes the grading, it includes the floor plates, it includes the roof lines, the massing, okay? And so we love to show these examples. My office put together uh, houses that might look sort of familiar to you, <laughs> but uh, we made little changes so that they're not exactly like the house that may have been the original reference, and then we put them together in ways that don't exist, okay? But look what we can do here. We can take a beautiful house from, I won't tell you what street, uh, and then another house from, I won't tell you what street, and you know, they're, they're all different. And here's uh, a building that is sort of you know, postmodern, very simple, but they're doing what the neighborhood is doing in terms of proportion and context, okay? Maybe not in the actual details, but certainly in context. Um, I know where the front entryway is. I can recognize the gable forms because that is part of the character of this neighborhood and so on. Um, 
Now you go down to another example, and we just decided to do something more like you know, a mid-century house. Same idea. I know where the entryway is, the proportion of the windows. OK, I want these Frank Lloyd Wright type cantilevers, uh, and I want to use different materials. But look at the relationship. When you drive down this street, uh, day or night, you're going to recognize that this house, even though it's a different style, belongs to this neighborhood by its character, by its uh, context. And then we do the one that doesn't make any sense, right? So you have no clear entryway. That's not an entryway. You have proportions that don't match the neighborhood. You have the grade being built up because why? Um, you know, because they don't want the water running back on their house. But the idea is that these all have some kind of context. This one is clearly was clearly designed and built without context in mind. So that's an example. That, that house does not exist. Uh, we just made one up. Here's another one. We love it when people want to double the size of their house, but there are ways to do it that work uh, in context because Bexley's tradition, its character is that the main block of the house is the prominent architectural feature, always. And the things that happen behind it or to the side of it are secondary. So the garage that might be on an alley or the garage that might be attached is always a secondary element. When we start seeing houses where they just want the space and they want the window to be here because their master bed is going to be here and, and all these things that are pragmatic but they don't follow the character of Bexley. And so we're trying to show people what these things are and how to avoid them so that you can build beautifully in context. That included an analysis of the different kinds of neighborhoods and their architecture. So here we have a three-bay house from South Bexley you know, with its double-columned porch. And we take each of these details, we shade it, and there's actually another reference in the design guidelines where you can see multiple examples of porches, multiple examples of window styles, and multiple examples of different kinds of chimneys in context. Okay, um, and every house is different. I live in a house uh, in South Bexley that was a sort of um, kit house, I guess, not Sears, but something like that. And there were it was there were like five designs you could choose from back in 1937. Well, it took me about six months living there where I realized that there are four other of my house on the street, but they're all different. Somebody decided to put a bay window instead of having their entryway there. The other one is flipped so that it's actually a mirror image of my house, and so on. And so you might drive through a neighborhood in Bexley like we did, and you might see a lot of the same, but everything's different, which is what we love about Bexley, the diversity of architecture here and the unity of the architecture. Bungalows, double bungalows, these are, you know, this is a, a duplex, um, but the proportions of these porches the details of the eaves for a Cape Cod and the quality of the Tudor detailing uh, with the timber and the stucco, a wall dormer, um, and then the mid-century houses that have cantilevers, chimneys, windows with particular proportions. It's all there. It doesn't matter what era we're talking about. Um, you can even go into the postmodern era of the 1970s and 80s and you will find houses, particularly in North Bexley or Central North, where the, all these rules are still in context, okay? Um, the problem is, is that today a lot of, of, a lot of us were not educated in, in this regard. We weren't trained in this regard. And so that's what the design guidelines are here to help residents and their architects and designers and their contractors understand. Um, so then we go in through pages of examples, good examples of different kinds of porches. Um, we look at the details and show you what they all mean. Now as a homeowner, you can tell your contractor, well, you didn't build the architrave right. You can teach them a little bit about uh, good design. It's a freeze. Here's the gutter. Here's the overhang of the soffit. Here's what needs to align. This is my favorite one because porches are typically today unfortunately designed where the roof system is not built in context with what is built on the ground. 
and so you have a lot of disparity. But in, in Bexley's history, the character of the porch, the relationship of what's above and what's below is quintessential to the beautiful porches of our city. And that relationship, if we can rebuild that um, in new designs, will be on a, on a much better track for uh, continuing Bexley's legacy of great architecture. Uh, here's some other details to avoid that don't fall into the character of Bexley. You might see these details in other neighborhoods, in other parts of Columbus, or in the region, or wherever you go. I was in the Isle of Palms for the first time last March, and I, I drive around at some of these houses that are out there, and they're all, they're all doing these details. And that's not even context of Charleston. So it's, it's becoming a kind of universal uh, language that is not, doesn't have particular character for a particular area like we have in Bexley. And here's some more examples of that particular character. Diamond, you know, leaded windows, shutters that actually work. Um, you know, the uh, schmear, the German schmear technique, uh, stucco and stone, uh, brick done well, modular brick, even late modern modular brick from the 1940s and 50s can be beautiful. Um, so all of these things, and then we describe windows and what it means to say that your window is a six over one, okay? Six lights over one is a six over one. You can come to ARB and you can talk about your new addition and you can talk about, si I, have, I have six six over one windows and we're all gonna go, oh yeah, ah. Modern, modern windows from the, the mid-century period, you know, there's different proportions that we can find, the golden, tri the golden section, um, doubling that. There's all kinds of ways that even in the simplest details of mid-century modern, you will find rules being used. Uh, here's some more examples of crowns and brick molds that are part of, all part of the character. And I think you can tell by now that one of the things that really uh, was a focus for me. We started with the neighborhood context, right? Defining all the different neighborhoods and how they were unique and related to each other. And when you get down to the details, that is uh, one of the most important aspects of these buildings. It has to be at every scale. It's the neighborhood scale, it's the whole Bexley scale, and then you get down to the human scale and you get to the detail scale. All of them have to work. Um, if, you're, if you don't have one that works, then the building is not a success, okay? And that's why we wanted to put this together for you. Here's examples of dormers that have you know, good Bexley character, and here's ones that don't. It just doesn't have a history here, and it's not done with the quality of detailing or proportion or light patterns. And then we actually took a stab to encourage designers and residents to come up with their own designs that would fit in context. None of these exist in Bexley. But we decided, our design team in our office, we just had fun. Let's just make some new Bexley porches. <laughs> and we're gonna try different materials, and we're gonna show you how you can do it, uh, following the rules, the guidelines, you know, for, for, the, for the city of Bexley based on its character. Uh, Eve conditions, what you do, what you don't do. Um, brackets, overhangs that have, you know, particular style for this, you know, like this is a sort of bungalow style overhang. Doesn't mean you have to do it with bungalow, but can you follow some of the rules uh, of this language of overhang and proportion when you go to do your 2023, 2024 uh, additions and new builds? More details that just don't have any character that, are, that are, you can find in the beauty of Bexley. So we, we keep coming up with these um, so that um, residents can really kind of start to visualize the difference. Why is this a good detail? Why is that not a good detail? That's not really fair. Well, it is fair when you start to look at the bigger picture and the context of how all these details work together. And I can tell you that the appreciation that my office had for all of the architecture of Bexley grew immensely just by stopping and taking pictures and walking around the neighborhoods and looking at the architecture and looking at the scale and looking at the relationship of the road to the tree, to the, to the front entry of the house, how many steps you went up to the house and so on. There is so much beauty in the city and we just want everybody to love it as much as we do. 
me and <laughs> we just went to town, you know, pulling up all these different uh, entryways. Some are classical, you know, here this one's kind of Baroque. You have a, you know, English tutor, uh, different colors, different materials. This one's some kind of hybrid Greek revival. Uh, colonial, you know, this is more of an English or French uh, Norman style. Um, and then you have a whole assortment of others. But what's common to all of these is this, the human scale, the proportion, height to width, um, the materiality, that you have these materials that you know what they are. Um, I know that cedar. I know these windows are wood or they're wood clad, right? They're metal. Because uh, we don't have any rules about the materials that you can or cannot use. We're working on that a little bit because some materials aren't good. But um, the idea that uh, Bexley does have a lineage of using good materials for its houses, and if you're going to replace them, what is the appropriate material to use to replace it? Uh, obviously, ec econ uh, the economics of materials is important for homeowners, but having the design guidelines, at least you'll be able to go through and say, well, I want this character because this is my house. You explained what my house is in these five pages in your design guidelines, and I want to keep that. How can you help me? And that's go to, go to Ms. Bocor, and she'll work it out with you. <laughs> um, there are other things. Go back uh, for a second to um, the roof. Is the roof one in there? Yes. Yes. So how many Bexley residents have looked at all the different kinds of slate that we have. And some of it is worse than others, right? Some of it is just a bad, so it was just a bad quality slate from Pennsylvania or wherever from the 1920s, 19 teens. Um, but other slates that we have here are really hard and, and good and last, or last forever. Um, but how many people notice that there are all kinds of design elements that go into slate? This is called a graduated slate, which means that the exposure of the pieces actually changes over the course of the roof. Sometimes it happens down low uh, on a swept eave, okay, that kind of curves. Sometimes it just happens from the beginning of the gutter all the way up to the roof. The exposure will change. Why do they do that? Because it actually gives you a more rested uh, sense of the roof, that it feels like it's rested on the building by having these compressions of the, of the proportion. And you get all these great colors. Look at this. But there's your, gra there's your graduated slate. Um, and then you have shake or different kind. You know, these slates just, they age so differently. Here's a French slate where you have different thicknesses to the pieces. That is uh, something that you don't see much in Bexley. You'll see more of it like in, in Dublin um, in Muirfield, where, they, where some of the residents really like this look. You see? Difference. Dublin? <laughs> We're not Dublin. So, the, gu the guidelines um, are really a way for, as, as I said, for uh, all of us to appreciate on so many levels that maybe we didn't appreciate before why Bexley is a special place. When I first moved here, that was, I, th I think in 2002, that was our motto, you know, Bexley, a special place. And I thought, oh, well, they're talking about the people because Bexley is a great place, a great community to live in. Well, Bexley is a special place because of all these things that you're going to find in the design guidelines. And um, we hope that we can continue to find more because it's really an adventure to discover more of why Bexley is, is so beautiful. And we'd like other municipalities to look at it, too, so that they can appreciate it, because I think all of this will only help to um, create better community. Um, Bexley can be a showcase for that. And you know, we're talking about existing buildings, additions, uh, new builds that will, be, that will come in. There are still empty lots in Bexley. I walk by a couple every day, um, where people can introduce you know, more of um, you know, additions to that character of my neighborhood. I look forward to that. Um, but the sense of continuing to move forward, because designs change, the times change, but there are some things that need to remain for that identity. Uh, who are we as Bexley? We have an identity, and it, a lot of it's based here in the architecture 
and in the streets that we, uh, we use every day. So, so I want to finish, in closing, I wanted to talk a, 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 just for a little bit about this whole concept of how we created this design guidelines. Because we, we really had, we worked on it a very long time. We, had, we did a lot of research. And all over the country looked at best practices. And we couldn't find any community that put together a comprehensive design guidelines and standards that included analysis of existing historical neighborhoods, drawing out what was beautiful about them, what, made, what makes neighborhoods beautiful, and then creating really what I think of, and you, guys, you who work with me all the time have heard me say this uh, time and time again, an educational piece. Um, that's how I look at this. This is just my textbook and the board's textbook and staff's to, to use to teach the residents. Because you will hear at our board meetings, and it is frustrating to some people who haven't really taken the time to read this and get to understand um, what we're about. It's not Bexley enough. But when you really study the neighborhoods and look at the details, you do understand it. And I hear time after time again, um, it's just going to cost too much if I do that much detail. The truth is, it may be a little more, but not much. It's marginal. It's really more educating people on how things should look um, and what the history is. So um, uh, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm actually more interested in the question and answers yeah. than anything, because just like this document is meant to be an interactive process, I, I love hearing your experiences, your questions, your observations, and then taking them back and just building on it even more. So um, at, at that point, I, I mean, at this point, you know, we're just, our next steps, obviously, having open forums, um, we're going to get out to the Board of Realtors, architects, designers, contractors, um, a lot of whom are here tonight, which is awesome. Um, and we will continue to update the city's website and get it to go live, really live, when you can click and get to what you're looking for. Um, that's the providing links. You know, life happens. Our technology guy left halfway through the year. So we will get there eventually. Uh, I, I, my technology is good but limited. Um, and you know, based on these kind of things, we'll continue to update and expand. So we will stay, I mean, I will stay as long as anybody needs, but I would love to hear questions, comments, concerns, ideas, et cetera. Are, they, are you taking anything online? Are people watching live able to uh, send in comments as well? Yes, uh, so I just, Anyone online, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the YouTube chat, and we will get those asked in the room. This may sound a little crazy, but I think a lot of us, a lot of just normal folk, walk down the streets and say, yeah, I like what I see, but they're not sure why they like it. Right. It just visually is appealing for some reason. So um, if you really get run out of things to do, you can get go through these guidelines, you can do a, an hour's read, two hour read, and all of a sudden you'll have a language that you'll understand, oh, I understand it, I see how the proportions work, oh, I see how the materials come together, and I see the thought that went into this. Uh, it's like art, and, and you begin to appreciate art once you understand kind of what goes into it. Um, and, then, uh, and then you impress your children with it and say, you know, I want you to walk outside, look, here's what, you know, da, da, da. They all said no. Bottom line uh, is the more that people become learned, educated, and knowledgeable about this, then that's a, that, that goes a long way to the, to the preservation and appreciation of what we've got. Uh, and then on that same front, there's a lot of other parallel things that go on. I'm sure most of you are aware uh, the Historical Society and the library are doing a 100-year home uh, uh, so where you can, you can, once your home hits that milestone, you can submit an application and you'll get a sign for the front that says 100 year, your 100 year house. And uh, eventually, uh, they'll, uh, they'll all get signs, they'll all be up there. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then the trees. Uh, uh, it, it, the trees become a very important, I think Bill said that very, very well, uh, because the tree, there's a layering effect. You drive down the street, uh, there's a, the, the trees folk, uh, create a perspective and a focus, uh, and then the houses are pedimented up just a little bit higher, uh, and that front to front and what goes on between that uh, becomes the richness of the space. 
Um, and, you know, the strange thing is we live on a bunch of very, very small lots. But somehow, because the way the fronts congregate and you get those perspectives, you get the trees, that really isn't what's noticed. What's really noticed is the character house to house to house to house to house. And it's just pleasant to drive up and down these streets. So a lot goes into what you see. And the more that any of us can be uh, missionaries for that, uh, that's for the better. Well, I'll certainly echo what Larry has just said, and Larry has very eloquently uh, given us the case for why we are where we are today. Uh, but I'll step back three decades ago. Uh, at that time, not only did architectural review not exist, there were very strong voices among elected officials and within the community against the concept of architectural review. Uh, and it was very boldly started about 30 years ago as a, essentially a two-year or so pilot project to see how it would work. And the wonderful outcome of that is not only what Larry has just said, but the wonderful outcome was that some among those who were against it came back and said, this was really the right thing to do. I just wanted to thank everybody who's been involved in this project, putting this together. I'm just a regular citizen, haven't been on a committee or anything. I love beautiful architecture, and I love the cohesiveness that I have noticed for some reason in Bexley. But it is wonderful to have a document that is illustrated so well and that clearly outlines the reasons for the cohesiveness that we might not even be aware of. And um, also, when you mentioned, Karen, that this is a project that you haven't seen duplicated in any other cities, it really makes me feel like it's a celebration for Bexley, that it can lead to something so much bigger yeah. than our little community um, being cohesive and beautiful and maintaining property values. So for all those reasons, thank you. Yeah, and, we, and we're doing that without um, over-regulation. Yeah. I mean, this, these are guidelines. There are other homeowners associations and municipalities uh, throughout the country that enforce very strict rules about paint color and things like that, kind of bricks that you can use. Uh, but that is not the character of Bexley. And we, want, we, we constantly had to remind ourselves that what makes Bexley so special architecturally and uh, contextually with the landscape and the streets is that diversity. And if somebody wants to paint their house purple, we're not going to stop them. That's not part of what this is about. Um, the great thing about having an appreciation for the rules of what we observe, OK? We're, we're making these rules. Well, science does this, right? We make rules based on what we observe. And the architectural guidelines are based on what we observe. And so designers, really good designers, um, they like to kind of push the envelope sometime, right? They like to step outside the bounds uh, of what is, you know, regular and, and, and unifies. But the greatest periods of architecture in history were where architects did that but still understood the rules and the context. Okay, so, I mean, there's plenty of examples I could give of, you know, Michelangelo, you know, designing in Renaissance, in the Renaissance. He stepped outside the bounds in certain ways. If you have res some restraint or knowledge about what unifies, the architects, their, their, their creativity starts to really flow um, instead of just whatever they want to do or being too confined by the, the, the rules. So Bexley is unique in that way where designers can come in and, pr and show us all kinds of things. We just got a new design that's going to be at the corner of uh, Roosevelt and Bexley Park. And the whole presentation of design was, it, it doesn't, it, you know, it's, it's a modern house, um, but all the things that, they, that this architect did in, in the layout and in the presentation was based on these guidelines. So it was, it was just a win-win for everybody.
one, one additional thing, uh, complementing what the ARB has done over these years, I was pleased to be part of that for a while, um, is also the help that people receive. And I think that's very, very important to know. Uh, this guy up here has probably saved more roofs from water damage because of details not coming together correctly as to how something would drain. And, and he would take the time to look at that. And, and then, you know, a resident would say, I have never guessed that. In other words, AKA I relied on my contact or I relied on whoever designed this thing. Well, they missed something. And so uh, that's the word that gets out as well. Uh, because our, it's not about a style, it's about doing something that's cohesive, works together, compatible, fits, uh, but likewise doesn't leak. And, and, um, I'm going to started, more details about how you came together when there was some pushback from elected officials going, yeah, we don't want to do this, but. There are probably three of us, four of us, I'm sure, that were there. <laughs> um, or Mike, you guys on the spot, too. You weren't there yet. I was not there. Um, that things were happening that just didn't, didn't look good. There were no rules. So um, a city council member came up with an ordinance to instate architecture review, and it wasn't so simple. Um, uh, the Kathy Rose and I put together um, all kinds of posters that showed things that weren't very attractive that were happening. We have since thrown them out because it's not very nice to put somebody's house out there, but they were. So we really went um, before city council and there was an ordinance and when it was first passed and Peter and um, Larry and Susan can cor correct any of my mis misremembering, um, it was only approved for one year at a time. And we had to come back every year for I think five years, if I remember right, um, to see if, we, if it would be renewed. And um, it was really hard for a lot of people to get used to the idea that, that, that there weren't absolute free for all homeowners rights, that, we, that, that they had to be reviewed. It was all part of the zoning board at that time. There was one board, the, the Board of Zoning Appeals, BZA, correct? Yes. And then there was a Main Street Commission and something else. If you want to add to any of this, please do. But after ev every year, it got more and more um, praise. Like at first, people were not happy that they were being told what to do. And then they would see the results. And then by the time maybe five or six years went by, we the architectural, the additions, the new builds were so improved as a result of this. And people who were so angry with me or the board members at the beginning would come back and actually thank us because we weren't trying to be punitive. We were trying to make your spaces better, more light, more usable outdoor space, bigger porches. We had that discussion already today, tonight. Um, and then I think it was probably year five, they passed it in perpetuity and I flipped over to becoming the staff person instead of being a board member. But for that first five years, Kathy Rose really just staffed it. Do you have anything to add? I mean, it, it, it was uh, no disrespect to their design um, abilities. They just were very property right, owner you know, rights and didn't want to impose this. As, just as a comment, there are a few uh, infill buildings that 
you know, really missed the mark, you know, in terms of materiality and the yeah. proportions that they didn't really study the context and yeah. The, and they the were ARB. on our, we call them our boards of shame. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is probably even yeah. before the review board. So I, I don't yeah. know when they were built. So if we can um, get, I think we're at what, minute 53 or something like that? Yeah. And I'll just um, look at the camera for uh, Mayor Kessler. And, uh, <laughs> and go, go to minute 53 in the video because this is, this is my, um, my um, the point where, uh, where I would like to push for continuing the design guidelines to extend to civic and uh, commercial. And there is, a, there is character in our commercial buildings in Bexley. Some of them are absolutely lovely. Uh, some of the more recent builds, some are, are, have good character, some don't have Bexley character. But you know, what we've noticed and what everybody's talking about uh, when, I, when I'm out uh, is that this area is going to grow. It's going to continue to grow. Um, there are business owners east of, of Bexley that are, that are talking about multi-story buildings going up uh, east of Gould. Okay, with apartments and mixed use. Uh, they're talking about it happening, obviously, over in Old Town East, along Main Street, and so on. If Bexley is going to be part of that growth, which we're going to be inevitably, then we need to address the character, which we have done with Main Street Guidelines, Main Street Guidelines 2, and now Main Street Guidelines 3, mm -hmm. uh, which <laughs> is a continuing development of what it means to build and on, on Main Street. But let's look at the commercial and the civic architecture so that we can maintain that character. You know, we lost, we've lost a lot of historic buildings in Bexley. Uh, we lost a beautiful one at Capitol um, that used to be right on Main Street. And, you know, there's, there's, there's all kinds of history there, and I wasn't around for any of that. But the more I would look back and see what we lost, um, we, need to, we need to gain. And we need to gain in a beautiful way on Main Street Cassidy and, and so on so yeah and and I would like to point out that to the credit of the staff at Bexley and to Mayor Kessler um, there is I don't even know if it was ever formalized but there is architectural review for everything that goes on in on Main Street yeah. now yeah. Um, just because there's not a document doesn't mean it doesn't happen for anybody who's been following the new building at 2200 East Main um, I would also encourage you to look up this new um, I can't think of what the name of it was before a bank in the mid-century modern that Cohatch has redesigned. Um, it, there's some really exciting stuff going on and to the mayor's credit and staff, that now, it didn't used to, but it now comes through Architecture Review Board before zoning, before it goes to zoning and planning as well. A lot of times, you know, people who are looking to develop on Main Street, they come to the ARB and they say, well, what, what do you mean Bexley character? It's a commercial corridor. All commercial corridors are the same. Uh, but they're not, and Bexley is not looking for that. We're looking for commercial buildings, right, that are going to have that Bexley character, and they always ask, what does that mean? So having background and more design guidelines would help them to be able to find that without, you know, putting something together and coming to us without, no without knowing. So it's, again, more education and appreciation of the history. We live in a strange time because the probably what in the last 10 years, more block faces have disappeared with four to five story apartment buildings and, and completely changing the streetscape throughout our area. I would have to say probably 50% of those are pretty banal, not really thought through, not giving much back to the street, not creating any energy at the street level. Uh, and so it behooves us when, when our time comes and some of that starts to occur, as is happening with 220 uh, in our area, that don't know, no, we're going to have something